for that introduction. As you heard, my name is Nicholas Zalquist, and I'm a professor at the University of Maryland just down the road from here. And my work is about using pictures to convey data. But tonight I'm going to talk about something that's a little different because one of our recent research projects in my team has been how do we visualize data for people who don't really have vision or have low vision, in other words, blind individuals. So let's just start to get this question of what is visualization out of the way. Here's an example. This is Jon Snow. Uh, not Game of Thrones, Jon Snow, you, but uh, medical doctor, the world's first epidemiologist. In 1854, London, he was charged with finding the cause of a cholera outbreak in the Soho district of London. And at the time, people didn't really know this thing about bacteria. So they were struggling to find a solution, but Jon Snow had the suspicion that this disease was waterborne. It was carried in the pumps that people used to fill to bring to their apartments. But it doesn't, didn't matter how much time he spent looking at the lists of cholera victims. He couldn't make sense of it. Until he had a flash of insight and he placed little dots on a map of the Soho district of where those victims were found. That's the map you see here. Each of the black bars that you see represents one victim of the cholera outbreak. And if you squint your eyes and look real hard, you'll see, as Jon Snow did, that there is a concentration of cholera outbreak victims around Broad Street, and in particular around a pump called the Broad Street Pump. So Jon Snow walked down to that pump, put a lock on it, and the disease just subsided. So this is an example, and it's not the first example in history of using visuals to understand data more efficiently than using numbers or text. There's lots and lots of examples in the past and if we fast forward to present day, we have a society that's even more information rich. Taking advantage of all this information, we can take use of our eyes, visualization, for example, to create pictures of this data in order to make better decisions and understand our world. Here are some examples of these. There are many, many more out there. But I'm here tonight to talk to you about what if you are blind? If you are blind, is that wonderful world of data forever locked away from you? Will you not be able to use this mechanism data, of data visualization where we create pictures of this data? And this is not a minor inconvenience, think about it. We use data for all kinds of things in society. We use it to choose which products to buy, where to travel, where to send our kids to school, or if we're going to school ourselves, we use it to understand topics. A lot of our courses are really uh, based on data. We even use it to, to choose who to vote for. So that means lots and lots of people, is, are they going to be bored? Are there going to be barriers stopping them from accessing all this information? This is also not a small population. Depending on you, who you ask, there's something like 300 million people who have visual impairment in the world today. 40 million of them are total, me, totally blind. <clears throat> and um, if you look at the United States, that number is somewhere between 7 and 15 million. That's millions of people that we are blocking from modern information-rich society where there's too much data in, that we cannot process if we don't have the right means. Think also about the fact that vision can be a fleeting thing. As people get older, they often see diminishing vision. And providing solutions for blind individuals can then help everyone. This is called the curb cut effect. Because adding curb cuts to sidewalks increases not just accessibility for people in wheelchairs, but also for people who, let's say, are pushing a stroller or dragging a heavy suitcase. So many times, the benefits we can provide a vulnerable population can also benefit the rest of the population. 
It's also curious that if you speak to blind individuals, you'll often hear them say that they are visual people. And that may seem like a contradiction in terms, right? But if you think about it, it's really not. All of us, everyone, we are navigating a physical world where there's shapes and spaces and objects. So we're all used to understanding space, even if we cannot see it. So there's lots and lots of potential for looking at research that can facilitate these individuals from accessing data and data visualization. Now, these things became very personal to me and my research group recently because we had a student signed up for a course who was blind and the accessibility center at, at my university got in touch and told us about this, we had to find ways to make this work. And a data visualization course, you not just have to be able to read the visualizations, you also have to create them. So it's not enough to just have some explanation of someone describing what the chart looks like. This right here is the solution we came up with. It's, it's a very low-tech solution. My student, Eric Neuberger, created this metal board with magnets and lollipop sticks, where an assistant who was in the room helping this blind student would take this board, arrange the dots, the magnets, the lollipop sticks, to represent what was on the screen. And then the blind student could use his fingers and, and, and hands to feel what the visualization looked like, even if he could not see it. But this also gave rise to an entirely new research agenda for us in trying to understand how to help these individuals and realize that there's many really exciting topics here and that this population is very underserved in that it comes to understanding data. Now, all of the examples I'll talk to you about tonight are examples of precisely this, sensory substitution. It means instead of vision, we use another sense. Instead of vision, we can use hearing. Instead of vision, we can use touch. That's this exact example. Or even one example, instead of vision, we can use smell. So let's start with hearing. It's one of the most common accessibility tools for blind individuals and has really become widely successful with the availability of smartphones. Because in a smartphone, you can download an app called the Screen Reader that will convert any written text into voice so that you can understand any website or any email that you get. The problem is, screen readers don't do well with images. You might have an alt text, a post descriptive sentence that says what's on the picture, but if your picture is a chart, that becomes much more difficult. Google chart, and you'll find examples like this. Lots and lots of images of different visualizations, bar charts, pie charts, line charts, and so on, representing information. The problem is, no alt text description will tell the full story. The pixels themselves don't tell the full story. You just also have to know the visual encoding, and you have to be able to read it. Sometimes you may get a data table that can be played instead of the visualization to the user, but often you're not that lucky. My collaborators and I had this problem, and we decided to use machine learning to have essentially a machine read the charts, extract the data, and present it to a blind user. Here's our pipeline. The left side is the input image, in this case, a bar chart. It gets sent to a classification stage where we determine what kind of graph is this, because it depends on the, the chart type will tell you how to read it. Is it a bar chart? Is it a pie chart? Is it a line chart? Is it something else? In this case, it's a bi uh, bar chart, so the next step will be to extract text for labels and values on the axes and legends. And then the next step is to actually detect the geometric objects that represent the data in any visualization. For a bar chart, that's the height or the width of rectangle. And in the end, we get numeric values by using the, our understanding of the scaling of the axes and the height of each of these bars, the labels. So we get a data table 
which we can, behind the scenes really, for a blind user, use so that a screen reader can replace an image with the actual data. This is one way to empower a blind user to overcome some of these barriers. Now, I talked about smell, so let's get to that point. What about smell? That might seem funny. Very few computer interfaces use smell so far. But there are certainly really valid reasons why smell can be a good substitute. Even if you're uh, sighted and you're currently driving a car or you're referring to a smartphone walking on the street, it's, it's really difficult to spend time glancing at a display when your eyes are busy already. But obviously, Another use would be for a blind individual who simply cannot see what's on the screen. This is an image of an olfactory display, a little like a visual display is a bunch of colored pixels on a screen. An olfactory display is a bunch of scents that gets blended together and then perceived by the user. In the foreground is a control tower that steers the whole thing. On the table is the actual display unit. It has 24 bottles. Each of those bottles contain essential oils, and there are ultrasonic diffusers in the caps, a little like your humidifier at home. And by turning them on and off, we can decide which scent is being emitted from the unit. And then the three fans you see will blend together the smells and send them into uh, the face of the user so they can perceive whatever we're conveying. A device like this we can use for for example, trying to emulate the real world. So if you're exploring a cave, you could have the smell of a damp moss. Or you're entering a bakery in a virtual reality simulation and you feel the smell of an apple pie. But we're actually more interested in using this for abstract data because those are the types of data that we encounter in the real world where people need to understand. So for example, think of using the smell of lemon mapped to the stock price of Google. Or using another sense to convey things like the mortality rate of a country or some physical process over time. That's the idea. This video shows my collaborator Andrea Bash using a mobile version of this olfactory display. This one she's using to explore a virtual reality simulation. And you can also see that this is a mobile version of what you just saw. It has six bottles instead of 24. And the little steam you see rising from those bottles is where the diffusers get activated and send the smell into her face. So depending on what she looks at, she'll get different sensations. The, the next image here will show you uh, the six bottle version of the tabletop display. So depending on what you're looking at, what you're zooming into, you will get different sensory uh, perceptions using smells in, in, a, in another uh, tabletop setting instead of the mobile one. All right, remember the magnetic board with the lollipop sticks? That's one example of using touch. There are many more examples. The most common people associate with blind individual is the braille alphabet, where we use little pegs that you can basically push up and then you can sense the letters using your fingertips and read entire sentences or entire screens. So what you see here is a refreshable braille display, which is an electronic version of a braille book where you can show about 10 to 40 characters depending on which device you're using. Those little pins that you see can go up and down. Now we have ongoing work where we're trying to think about how to use that kind of display which many blind individuals already have in their possession and kind of use it to show data instead. So imagine having a bar chart like this one and then mapping each of the bars to a key of the braille display in a row and then filling in the dots from the bottom to the top depending on how high the bar is. So if it's very low, it might get zero, uh, zero pins pushed up but if it's really 100% full, you'll get all six pins pushed out. And then, eventually, by not having access to the actual histogram, you can run your fingers across this display and feel the data. And the benefit here is, again, we can empower blind users to access this kind of data using existing devices and remove some of the barriers that we already saw. 
All right, so the last example I'll talk about here is some ongoing work in my lab, which is this little thing. It's a three-wheeled micro-robot, and it has a handle and a vibrating little cap. And this, the idea here with this device is in the final version, it will be entirely wireless. You could place it on any flat surface, connect your smartphone or laptop, and then use it to grab that, this handle, and the, the device will, will move your arm and hand. It might, uh, it might vibrate at certain points that you understand some aspect of this data. And you could use it, for example, to show the stock market value of Microsoft or how your checkbook has looked over time or something similar to that. So really use the sense of touch and the sense of your, your body to understand the shape of data. The common denominator for all of these projects that I've talked about is about ensuring equal access of all the rich data and information that we have available to us, to all the individuals. And I've talked about how many of these things can not just benefit this vulnerable population of blind users, but also support all of us. So in uh, the forthcoming work we're doing, we're looking at various ways to to solve more problems in this really exciting piece of therapy. I want to close by thanking my students and collaborators who were part of doing all this work. That's commonly the case for professors. I work, get to work with brilliant students and also the sponsors who made this possible. And also, thank to all of you for your attention.